I'm live. Hello, food wishers. Uh, as you might notice, we're in a new location here. Um, I've been told that if I get closer to the internet juice, whatever that's called, uh, the wireless, that I will not have as much buffering, which is, I guess, when I look like I'm digitizing. Uh, sorry for all the technical terms, as you can tell. I'm basically an old line cook that's trying to figure all this out. But anyway, we're in our living room. Um, in lieu of any kind of trophies, I have some bobbleheads in the bookcase here. Uh, and if you know those giants, uh, you've been a fan for a while. Anyway, uh, today's theme, we yes, we actually have a theme this time, uh, is going to be some of my must-have kind of hand tool, kitchen equipment type stuff. Um, so if you have questions, I noticed a few people got up early and uh, clearly nothing going on this morning and already have asked some questions. We're going to get to those. Uh, I'll answer a few of those first, and then we're going to get into this equipment recommendations, and then we'll have the usual free-for-all, uh, no rhyme or reason, stream of consciousness, um, and go from there. Uh, first question here uh, actually is for you. I have a fan on me because it's 100 degrees in my living room. Can you hear the fan? Does everything sound good? Do I sound as bad as usual? All right. No news is good news, as they say in the business. So uh, actually, I want to hit this one question first. Uh, by the way, hello to everybody who said hello. Hello. Uh, I think Plenty wants to know how pancakes light and fluffy. And since we are technically uh, still in the morning time here in California, one of the greatest tricks ever for light and fluffy pancakes, since they all call for eggs, is actually separate the eggs, mix up the batter as directed, and then whip the egg whites to a soft meringue in a separate bowl, and then fold everything together before you put the batter in the pan. And that will give you a lot of rise and a lot of lift, and that's how the fancy, fancy pancakes are made. Very difficult to do in a restaurant because, you know, you can't be whipping meringues and then trying to cook eggs benedict and scrambled eggs and stuff. But at home, when you have time and you're only cooking for a few people, separate your eggs, whip your whites, and that will make your pancakes super light and fluffy. And uh, all right, a couple more quick ones, and then we're going to get into this scintillating equipment recommendation part. Um, Mead wants to know, how come it's okay to use 450 degree temperature for our focaccia recipe because it uses extra virgin olive oil, and apparently people are being told never use virgin olive oil in a hot, hot oven. Well, that's not necessarily true. If you're doing something fried in a pan and you're getting it smoking hot, maybe extra virgin olive oil is not the best choice. But in a, on a pizza or on bread, um, I think we're okay. All right, the Italians have been uh, using olive oil on things going in like 700 degree oil, 700 degree oven since, you know, Caesar was eating uh, pizza. So anyway, I think we're okay there. Uh, and I'm not uh, a scientist. I know some people are like, well, at a certain temperature, the free radicals do this and the uh, molecules do that. That's not my business. Talk to somebody that knows things. Uh, oh, and then the last one here, and then we're going to get to the equipment and I'll hit the rest of the questions later. What do I think? Enrico wants to know. Uh, Enrico with two friends. Are you guys splitting the membership price three ways? That's not a bad idea. Uh, Enrico with two friends wants to know, what do I think of the jars of chopped garlic in the supermarket that are you know packed in the oil or the water? I hate few things as much as that stuff. Uh, I don't think it tastes good. I think it has a weird preserved, weird flavor. Um, I don't trust it. I think you should never buy it. Um, I, I, I guess in some kind of large scale, like you're feeding, you know, 300 people at, a, at some kind of event and you just literally have no time to chop garlic, maybe for some kind of roasted meat thing, it would be okay and would not be noticeable. But I would hate to come over to your house for dinner and you would make me something that had preserved garlic in the chopped up in the jar. Um, having said that, if you use it, no offense, but I think it's a crime against nature and I would not use it personally or recommend it under any circumstances. So there you go. 
Thanks, Enrico. By the way, uh, if you're wondering how to answer, how to ask a question, uh, or if you're wondering how to answer a question, that's a that's a much tougher question. But if you're wondering how to ask a question, all you have to do is join and become a member, which just means click on the join button under any video, and that makes you an official food wisher. And you, in the future, will get these amazing updates from the new kitchen and our. Uh, our farm estate in the country that we're trying to build and uh, plants, which is, uh, you know, going a little slow. Uh, generally, uh, I don't think you want to start these projects right before a pandemic. But uh, anyway, it's getting there. Uh, there's going to be tons of mo way, way more interesting content coming up. So hang tight. In the meantime, you do get to ask questions during chats. And I do share some uh, pictures, uh, mostly of garlic, since that's literally the only thing we planted so far. Uh, but now the nurseries, I think, just got permission to open. So uh, we're going to be putting a lot more in the ground. So anyway, uh, long story short, go hit the join button, become a member, and then you can tell your friends you're a member of Food Wishes. And uh, they'll, they'll be pretty impressed. That's what I hear. People are saying. Uh, some people are saying. All right, here we go. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything crazy. All right, all right, everything sounds okay? Sounds good, everything's okay, very good. All right, and I'm gonna go back and definitely probably missed a bunch of these uh, questions, so uh, I'll do my best to catch up. All right, first product recommendation. Uh, and this is gonna be fairly random because everything I do is fairly random. Um, but the first thing most people don't have that every chef and professional kitchen has that you need is the spider, uh, it's a strainer. Now I should probably have some way to film these things separately, but I don't. Uh, this is called a spider because it's short for spider web. Um, and this is what we use to scoop stuff out of boiling water when we're blanching vegetables or cooking gnocchi or uh, you got a handful of pasta in the water and you wanna scoop it out into the sauce. Since no one ever should just put plain macaroni or pasta or spaghetti in a bowl and then pour sauce over it. That is not the way it's done. Uh, so this is something every kitchen needs and has to have. It's called a spider. Don't ask me about brands. Brands don't matter for anything I'm about to show you today because they're all the same. Every spider that looks like this and is on the kitchen supply site. Um, oh, there's one tip. You don't need to go to a fancy store or order from the fancy store with the French words in the name. Just find a restaurant supply store near you, and generally they generally they all you know sell to the public. Uh, so find a spider. All right. So that's the first thing. Secondly, the good old bench scraper. You must have a bench scraper. This is. I mean, obviously it scrapes. So when you're cleaning down your cutting board or your work surface after making any kind of bread or floured material, this just scrapes everything up like a dream. No more scrubbing, no more rubbing, scraping. Also for chopping up the portions, uh, for when you chopped up a bunch of veggies, you'll, you've seen me use this in videos where I scoop under and put it in the pot. Uh, now people that use cleavers are like, yeah, how about just get a cleaver? So that's why a cleaver is useful because it has that big old blade that you can use kind of the same way. But for doing baking and pastry, bread making, anything related, this is a must have. If you know someone that cooks like even a little and they don't have one of these, I know it's pretty early for Christmas shopping, but this is what they should get for a gift. Bench scraper, also known as pastry cutter, I think. Is that what this is called? Maybe it's not. Forget I said that. Pastry cutter, I think, is the thing you chop uh, butter into flour with. Uh, although I've seen this called that. Bench scraper is the official term. Get one of these. All right. Oh, here we go. Most people have strainers, like the kind you just drain spaghetti with. But you, but you need some fine mesh sieves or sieves. And, uh, you know, I could list a thousand things to use these for, but I won't. This is very important. If you're straining stocks or sauces, this will give you just the good stuff coming through and all the fibrous materials will be trapped, 
Whereas in, if you use a, you know, standard um, big box, you know, kitchen section store strainer, the holes are much bigger and stuff gets through. And then you got big stuff in your little stuff. So what you want to do is get one of these fine mesh strainers. I have about four or five different sizes. This is the smallest. Also, we use this to, oops, also we use this to shake powdered sugar on things, usually French toast. Uh, and that's what you need that for. All right, get some of these. They're not cheap, but they're worth it. All right, here we go. Very uh, common, but people are confused about kitchen tongs. Hold on. I got two here. One with the silicone and or plastic heat proof tip for your nonstick pans. Good old fashioned metal one. These are the only tongs, only style, that you should ever buy for the kitchen. All right, if you do a search for kitchen tongs, you'll see, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 different varieties uh, with handles and different claw pincers and strange flat things. Don't buy any of those. This is the only one approved by line cooks. This is the only one you will ever see in a restaurant, except for those super expensive restaurants where the, the chefs use those little like um, tweezer things. Uh, then those are expensive restaurants. Be careful. If you, if you see a chef, if you walk by a restaurant and look in the window and the chef's using tweezers, that's going to be an expensive restaurant. But anyway, for all the other restaurants, you go in the kitchen. This will be the only pair of tongs you see. Uh, maybe it'll be a little longer, maybe a little shorter. But this super cheap, super heavy-duty thing is the only one you want. So this is my official tong recommendation. Uh, accept no substitutes. Uh, and then be careful, you don't pinch your finger in the top, very common injury, especially with the cheap ones. So, you know, spend a few dollars, even the expensive ones are cheap, uh, and get one that has a heat-proof plastic for your nonstick and a regular one, and get a couple. And, of course, for the outdoor grill, same, same thing. Uh, along the same lines, a flexible, heat-proof rubber, rubber, I guess I'm calling it rubber because I'm old. I think this is plastic, actually. But a heat-proof, flexible spatula, you've seen this used in like 2,000 videos almost. Uh, this is indispensable. And, you know, a metal spatula is fine for outdoor grill for some stuff. But this I could not live without. Uh, again, get a few of them because, you know, you'll need it and one will be in the dishwasher and you'll be upset. So a flexible, very important, it's a little bit flexible. Not flimsy, all right? Flimsy and flexible are not the same thing, all right? All right, what else do I have? I got a bag of goodies here. Oh, we did the microplane uh, in last chat. Someone was asking about cheese graters. Uh, I have the big one with the big holes. This is for your ginger, your nutmeg, your Parmesan, your pecorino, your many other things, uh, zest, and of course. So you have to have one of these. If you don't have one of these, um, you should get one. All right. Let's say you want to pound your meat and you go to use a pan or your fist and it's just not very efficient or effective. And we do pound meat in a fair amount of videos. This is my favorite meat pounder. Very simple design, very heavy, and that does the job. Well, I thought it was dirty, it's just scratched. Um, so this is one I recommend. The one on the handle, the mallet, type our parents used. Also is pretty good, but it, it just is not as heavy and there's not as much surface area. So if you're using the mallet kind and it works for you, great. But if you can, try to get one of these. Uh, also another tip, I feel very uh, scared one of you is going to crack your countertop because I always show pounding right on my stone, uh, Caesar stone countertop here in San Francisco, uh, which I shouldn't do, but I do. Uh, you want to use a cutting board or use a different uh, surface uh, as long as it's sturdy and there's some, uh, it doesn't, you know, uh, trampoline on you, uh, it'll work. Uh, so be careful using this. If you miss and you're on stone, it will definitely crack. Uh, I've seen the videos. So get one of these. Be careful, though. It can be very expensive. Uh, silicone spoonula. Oh, yeah. A lot of people have spatulas. A lot of people have spoons, 
but you need a spoonula. All right, when I'm sauteing and doing stuff in a pan and tossing some pasta and sauce or many, many other things, this is my go-to tool to grab. It scoops, it pushes, it tosses, it turns. It will even fold in a pinch, okay? So, uh, you know, here you go. Get, get a set of these, couple different sizes, couple different lengths, and learn the magic of the spoonula. By the way, I'm getting paid for none of these recommendations, even though I should be. So spoonula companies, you know, holler at your boy. All right, spoonula have been covered. Next couple things are called dishers, also known to the common folk as scoops. All right, come in different sizes. Uh, they're for generally sorbet, I think is what they were invented for. And I know you're thinking, I don't eat sorbet. Why do I need a sorbet scoop? Well, you need it for when you make cookies. And the recipe says a rounded, uh, you know, a couple tablespoon per dough per cookie. Um, just use one of these. It is 8 million times faster. And you get the exact same amount in each one. You're making little meatballs. All right, you're filling ravioli. You're doing little crab cakes. You're, I don't know, I can't think of any other things. But these are so much faster, so much more efficient than just trying to scoop some with a spoon and, you know, eye it and then scrape it off with another spoon. Um, that's how most people do it. And they don't realize how hard that is until they get one of these or a couple of these. And then they're like, why didn't I have that before? All right, we're getting down to the end and then we'll answer some questions. Um, oh, melon baller. You have to have a melon baller. Uh, and first of all, raise your hand if you've had melon balls within the last year, all right? Let's see, no hands, all right? No, you don't use this to ball a melon. You could, some people do. Um, but what you use this for is like scraping the inside of a zucchini out you're gonna stuff, all right? Coring the inside, the seeds out of a pear that you're gonna poach. Uh, this is one of those tools that you don't realize all the things you'll use it for until you get one and it's in your drawer. And then you go, oh, go grab the melon baller. Uh, and yes, every once in a while in the summer, we wanna maybe ball a nice honeydew and drizzle it with some of that liqueur that tastes like melon and get it nice and cold and surprise our significant other with some balled melon. That's a nice romantic gesture, okay, underrated. All right, melon baller, get one, even though you don't think you need one, they're cheap. All right, hold on. I got a uh, very expensive paper bag here. I'm holding all this stuff is, all this stuff in. All right, we're down to two. Pincers for pulling salmon bones out and other bones out of fish. Uh, you know when you bought that fish and they said it was boneless and you got home and it wasn't, there was a couple like little pin bones in there and then you tried to tear them out and all the fish ripped with it. So then you tried to cut it out and you ended up eating chopped up fish. Okay, this, you just grab it beep, and it will pull right out. Uh, put your fingers next to the bone, pull this this way and the bone comes out. So, you know, optional, I wouldn't say this is mandatory or can't live without it, but very, very useful. And then last, but certainly not least, I give to you the freakishly small wooden spoon. Uh, yes, one day I would like to sell these myself for fun and profit. So stay tuned for that, I'm not able to yet. Uh, and this is not, I've heard people comment, no, this is not the original freakishly small wooden spoon. I actually mailed that to a fan a couple years ago. I don't know why, it was, that was ridiculous. Uh, but I had a, you know, a moment of uh, generosity and kindness and I mailed it to somebody who was going through a little tough stretch uh, anyway, this uh, is a nice thing to stir small amounts of food in small pans, especially nonstick. Also, when you use a mortar and pestle and you don't want to use a, a metal spoon on the, on the stone, uh, I always go with this. And I, as you know, just use it in videos so I can say freakishly small wooden spoon. Uh, and where I learned this, I used to work for a chef who used to carry this in his pocket like this. He, had, he would have like a pen and his glasses and a wooden spoon and he would pull it out and he would 
taste things with it. And I always thought it was like a super cool look. In fact, he would use one spoon to put it into this spoon and then he would taste it. It was a whole like ritual. And I was just fascinated by it. And I thought to myself, one day when I have a YouTube channel, I'm going to get a freakishly small wooden spoon and then use it in some of the recipes for no apparent reason and call it the freakishly small wooden spoon. And of course, we also have that I also gave away the freakishly small, freakishly small wooden spoon that was even smaller. But those are long gone. Um, they got, you know, one got burnt, I think, along the way or singed. And uh, but anyway, now I'm down to this one. I got to get some more. I'm not crazy about this one. The handle is not as freakishly small as I would like. So stay tuned for that. All right, I'm going to take a drink of water. Excuse me. Okay, let's get to some of these questions. Um, if you have product recommendation questions, we'll hit those first. And I'm going to go make sure I didn't miss any of the early ones because people got up like really early. Some people line up. Um, you know, it's like when a new iPhone comes out, people line up hours ahead to get the first questions in, which is great. Uh, Mark wants to know, why don't you save bacon fat while cooking? I love to use it for so many things. Mark, I do save it sometimes. I just don't save it all the time because how much bacon fat can we have hanging out? Um, now, I know a lot of people don't save bacon fat, which is why I show how to wipe the pan with a paper towel trick when we're cooking something with bacon. So that's just for the mass public consumption. But yes, if you're cool and you're uh, wanting to save money, you should definitely save and strain your bacon fat and use that just like you would butter when you're frying other things, um, unless you're a vegetarian. Of course, that's not a good idea. All right, here we go. People are saying they can't hear the fan. That's good. Mark's planning a uh, herb garden today. Very good, Mark. Ducko, did I say that right? Uh, and again, I'm going to miss all the hellos, but hello, everybody. Uh, of course, thank you so much for your memberships. I really appreciate it. Um, I love seeing the little thing next to people's names. I don't know what that is. Circle with two lines. Who came up with that? Uh, and they're different colors depending on how long you've been a member. Very cool. Welcome, Tim. Hey, welcome aboard. Stay tuned for some amazing garlic pictures. Uh, oh, someone asked about hard neck versus soft neck garlic. If you can get hard neck, get it. Plant it, grow it. Hard neck garlic is the best garlic. It blows regular garlic that you get in the supermarket away. Um, the cloves are bigger. They're easier to peel. They separate easier. There's none of those little micro cloves inside. Please do yourself a favor. And if it's too late now where you are in the fall, plant some uh, fall hard neck garlic that you harvest in the spring. I think that's how that works. Okay. Have you tried Fleischmann's pizza crust yeast? No, I don't understand pizza crust yeast. Is that different? That sounds like a scam. Sorry, Fleischmann's. I like, I like, I like their yeast, but I, don't, I think yeast is yeast. Isn't yeast yeast? I'm not a scientist, so I don't know. Maybe... Maybe it's different. Oh, Jim has the same Pagan bobblehead. I'm not a big bobblehead guy. They're, they kind of creep me out. But uh, I didn't even realize they were there when I moved this location. Uh, is the buffering better? Have we been buffering? All right. Uh, uh, Shawnee loves barley soup. Well, thank you for letting us know. Um, people were asking me. Does Shawnee, what, what, what kind of soup does Shawnee like? Welcome aboard, Chris, Michael. All right, let's get to a question here. Uh, Tim doesn't have a question, but I changed his life by bringing the love of cooking into it. I appreciate that. That's the goal. Um, if I brought love into your life, you're welcome. It's my pleasure you brought love into my life. Um, now I'm going to stop or I'll start weeping. But anyway, I love, uh, I love hearing that people are actually using these videos, not just for a few dumb laughs, but that they actually cook for their loved ones and so forth. Elise, thank you very much. For eggs with caviar, my eggs don't come out good. What am I doing wrong? Uh, first of all, I love this question because you just totally glossed over that you're, you're doing eggs with caviar. Um, first of all, just eat the caviar. Why are you putting it on eggs? But if you insist, on putting caviar on eggs. Um, and if you're like a billionaire that's literally putting like beluga caviar 
on uh, eggs. I'm going to have to get one of those, what is it, Venmo accounts. And uh, you can ask me questions directly. But anyway, um, I don't know what you mean by they're not coming out good. Are they not coming out soft? Are they, wh what's happening to your eggs? I need more information. Um, I should do a review of how to scramble eggs because people just generally screw those up. And it's a shame because there's nothing easier. Uh, so I'm not sure, Elise, I would love to answer your question, especially for $4.99, but I don't know exactly what you mean. So um, please give me some more info, um, especially if you have to pay to ask the, the to clarify the question. Uh, Tammy wants to know if she should buy a certain mixer or less expensive brands that are just as good. Well, if they're just as good, I think you just answered your own question. I always tell people to get the best piece of equipment, the highest rated, the best reviewed in their price range. That's pretty kind of, you know, dumb advice. But that's what I that's what I tell people for mixers, for knives, for pans. If you can afford if you can afford a five hundred dollar piece of equipment, get it. Good for you. All right, we're we're all behind you. Uh, if you can't find the best hundred dollar version, if that's your price range. Um, most of the name brands are really um, about the same quality wise. Man, I really need a haircut. Um, I know it sounds weird. I have no hair. Uh, but anyway, yes, most of the brands uh, are very comparable uh, that are in the same sort of classification of high end, low end, medium end. Um, I love the I love the KitchenAid mixer. Uh, that's what I use. I don't remember if they sent me one many years ago, so I should probably disclaim that. Is that a law? Um, actually, no, a friend sent it uh, who worked with them. But anyway, I think it's a great machine, but I've seen other mixers and I've used other mixers. And as long as it mixes and your egg whites fluff up or whatever you're doing, it, it, it works. So uh, that's how I answer that. Uh, welcome aboard, Matthew. All right, here we go. Whoop, I'm getting behind on the questions. Oh man, I knew this was gonna happen. I see lots of hearts. All right, here we go. Yes, Chef John's got a brand new bag of kitchen utensils. Thanks, Grape Tomato Girl. Sorry, I'm resting my voice. I did a voiceover yesterday for uh, Apple Crumble Coffee Cake, which is gonna air this coming Friday, right before Mother's Day. Oh my God, it was insanely good. Stay tuned for that. What does, uh, first last wants to know, what does one use to make cake layers for Russian honey cake? I think I did a video for that. We use just regular Silpat. Um, so I'm confused by the question a little bit. Uh, check out our honey cake video, and I think you will see what we used. Uh, Freakishly small wooden spoon does not come up on Amazon, bag puss cat. Uh, which is a problem. It should, and I should be selling it. Uh, so one of these days. How many layers of stainless steel should my pans, pots have? Carmen wants to know. I have no idea. I do not design or build pots and pans. I never understand any of that kind of fine print. Um, the heavier, the better. That's how I can tell. If you pick up a pan and it's heavy, it's good, usually. And if it's light, it probably doesn't have layers. All right, so yes, I like layers just because it means the pot's thicker. Um, other than that, I can't give you specifics. Cutting board, rec, or RCG5 wants to know about cutting boards. Wood, plastic, bamboo. Uh, I have all the types. Um, one of the saddest things ever when I worked in San Francisco restaurants, at one point they outlawed wooden cutting boards, which is the most ridiculous thing any ever because they think it's a health hazard except people have been using wood cutting boards for you know thousands of years and without a problem. Um, so I'm a big fan of the wooden cutting board. If it's properly washed and sanitized and you salt it, if you use meat, you can throw salt on there and rub it with like a cut lemon or some vinegar water and then use your bench scraper to scrape it off and let it dry, rinse it off, let it dry. Um, wood is perfectly safe and so, so much nicer to cut on than plastic, I think. Uh, bamboo, sure, wood is wood, as far as I'm concerned. The only thing I cannot abide by are those glass cutting boards. Who the heck cuts on a glass cutting board? I've seen them, people say, oh no, it's perfectly fine. No, it's not. 
the sound is like just the worst noise ever. And I cannot understand anyone that would find any kind of pleasure cutting on a glass cutting board. So if you have a glass cutting board, please throw it away and get a wood one. Uh, Sydney wants to know scoops. What should you get most common? Just like the, the half ounce, the one ounce, the two ounce, I would say is a good way to go. Four ounces, like a quarter cup. That's like a big meatball size. Um, so just get a small assortment of small ones. I can't give you any specifics other than that. But I say half ounce, which is one tablespoon, would be the smallest scoop I would get. And then a two tablespoon, one ounce scoop uh, that could double as a shot glass uh, would be my next choice. Yes, A. McConnell wants to not back in, not bacon fat, but schmaltz. Clear chicken fat for all savory recipes, risotto, savory pasty. I'm assuming they're answering somebody else. But yes, if you cook chicken, you can save the chicken fat just like you can save bacon fat. Very delicious. Very schmaltzy. <clears throat> what kind of empanadas, baked or fried? Nick, I got a confession for you. I am not a huge empanada fan. Um, I don't know why. Generally, when I eat those kind of stuffed pastries, I'm much more into the filling than the dough. And I think I've maybe gotten some bad empanadas that were, they had too much dough and too big of a crimp going around them. And it was kind of good, but it was just like too much um, tough pastry crust. So maybe I ate some bad empanadas. Um, I would love to eat them if, it, if it's a good one. Uh, baked or fried, I don't care. That's, I'm not picky. But anyway, I need to probably make some empanadas for the uh, for this channel, do a video, and learn how to make good ones, and then totally change my attitude about um, empanadas. Sorry, it's kind of freaking me out a little bit there. All right. Quick. Sorry, I, I see these words in your name, and, it, and they make words in my brain, but they're not. I was going to say quick, but it's really QK Calvin. My six-year-old lid, my six-year-old daughter, I don't know what ILD means. Uh, little daughter, maybe? Just busted out me watching, just busted me watching this without her and gave me heck. Sorry I had to share that. Never watch these chats without your kids. Come on, people. That's just bad parenting. All right, yes, bring all the family in. I, I rarely swear. I used to swear in the videos before, you know, I had corporate overlords. Now I have to say heck and darn and gosh. Gosh darn it, that got too brown. So if you go watch some of the old videos, um, some were a little salty, if you know what I mean. Uh, can you, uh, Rima wants to know, can you use sourdough discards in pancakes, banana bread, biscuits? I think you can. I don't know how, though. Uh, I think you're talking about when you feed your sourdough starter, that sort of foamy, yeasty batter you throw away. Yes, there are recipes online for making pancakes with those uh, or with that. So I would go check that out. I know you can do it. I have to admit, I, I don't do that. I think I tried it once and the pancakes came out <clears throat> really heavy. But that might have just been bad, you know, bad pancake making skills. Uh, still wreck Instapot, great for dried beans. Yeah, I haven't done the Instapot yet, don't have one. Not sure I'm gonna get one. Um, it's kind of like Tiger King, I don't think I'm gonna get involved, I don't know. Mike Clark did beef randang. If you haven't made beef randang, you should definitely make beef randang. Oh, if only uh, so you can say beef randang. It just sounds so good to say. Uh, can we see your kitchen? Michael wants to know. No, you can't. Actually, I've already showed it. Uh, it's in the, <clears throat> let's see, what video is that? Our five, our thousandth video, I think. Did, anyway, there's a, there's a q and A. I I think I did it uh, when we hit a thousand videos that I believe covered the kitchen a little bit. So uh, it's pretty unremarkable. Maybe we'll do that one of these next chats. Uh, but what I'm really waiting for is the big reveal for the new kitchen at Kismet, which is going to be fabulous, I hope, when eventually it's done. And that you're going to see. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, thermometer rec. Thermometer wreck needed by Bob Goulash, who I will now rename Bob Goulash. Uh, Bob Goulash wants to know about a thermometer wreck. Um, the, just get a regular probe thermometer that has the range from freezing, sub-freezing, all the way up to past, you know, 500 degrees. And then you could use it for meat or deep frying. Uh, digital, yes. I like digital. One of the little candy thermometers that you stick on the side of the pot that just you see the dial. Those are fine, I think, for making candy, but who the, who the heck makes candy? Um, so anyway, that's as good a wreck as you're gonna get. How do you clean a fine mesh strainer? I put them in the dishwasher and gunk solidifies in them. You know what, I don't know, uh, Sharon, our dishwasher does an amazing job at the old mesh strainer. Uh, I guess you're gonna have to give them a little pre-scrub or pre-spray. And then try that. Um, and having said that, what I don't know about cleaning recommendations could fill a book. So I'm not sure about that. I just am happy that our dishwasher um, <clears throat> uh, does a really nice job at cleaning those. Do, 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 under the tap. Yeah, someone said just rinse it. Oh, Brian wants to know if, if I want to use a torch for finishing the top of a dish, does it have to be a special torch or gas for food safety reasons? No. Any blowtorch from the hardware store will work, I think. If someone knows this is incredibly dangerous info I'm giving, uh, our legal department would love it if you would chime in and let me know, and I'll correct myself. But if you are going to buy a uh, blowtorch for finishing your creme brulee or putting some nice you know, brown marks on your whatever, uh, don't go to the fancy kitchen store and pay like $50 for the little, you know, um, you might as well use one of those, you know, uh, hurricane lighters, which I think I did a baked Alaska video. If you watch our baked Alaska video, I actually torched the meringue on it with a lighter. It actually worked pretty good. Uh, but if you are gonna go buy one of those, stay out of the fancy stores, Go to your local hardware store and just get a cheap old industrial strength blowtorch with the little propane tank, and that's all you need. Just don't tip it sideways. They stop, and it, you'll have issues. But anyway, that's what I use. I haven't used one in a long time. I should, I should blowtorch something soon. <clears throat> Wait, someone said, Sharon, great question. Did I miss Sharon's question? Oh, about the strainer. Yeah. I didn't answer it. It was a great question and a terrible answer because mine come out clean. Uh, yeah, there's Sharon's getting lots of good advice. I'll just let people read the chat. But yes, if you bang it upside down, that dislodges the stuff um, and so forth. Someone wants to know my favorite, well, not someone, QC Kelvin wants to know if I have a favorite side dish for sirloin steak. Anything potato. Anything, literally anything potato. Uh, picking side dishes is like picking music for a road trip. That was kind of random. Uh, but the point is, how the heck do I know what you like? I don't. So I would just do some mashed potatoes, some french fries, some fried potatoes, some home fries. Um, if it's a potato, I will eat it. Uh, potato salad, if you want to do the cold, hot contrast, I think potato salad is an underrated side dish for hot food. So there you go. Do a nice, fresh, spring-like potato salad with lots of fresh herbs and greens and serve that with your mother's steak, and I think everyone will be happy. Uh, I don't have a recommendation for stainless steel pans other than get the best one you can in your price range. Um, because they are, I think, affiliated with my, with Meredith, my corporate overlords, I am a huge fan of my Better Homes and Gardens stainless steel pans. That, again, is not a commercial, not a plug. I don't get paid to say any of this stuff. Um, so if you can find those, if they even still make them, do they make them? I haven't looked for, you know, five years. They sent me some a long time ago. But uh, I really, really like the Better Homes and Gardens pans if those are available. There you go for an affordable recommendation. Other than that, I don't want to start going through brands. 
Mike wants to know, Mike Clark wants to know my favorite meal to eat. I do not have one, never have, and I never will. Uh, having said that, you know, some roast chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy, you can't go wrong with that. Welcome to all the new members. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm trying to see all the names, but I, I lost track. And they have hard names sometimes, and I'm embarrassed to try to say them. Uh, thanks, Ivana. Oh, Elise Reyes has a clarification for four ninety four ninety nine. It was Jean George Jean George recipe who made egg caviar. I'm a big fan of yours, so I thought I saw it on your channel since I'm always here. So you actually asked me a question about another chef's recipe and paid to do so. I think that's what we call in the business poetic justice. Anyway, at least I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to have to check out that recipe. Is it eggs made into caviar? Is it caviar made into eggs? Is it eggs top of caviar? I'm so, I'm so uh, curious. So I'm going to go check that out after the chat. Thanks, Craig. Right back at you. Uh, hold on, we have a uh, we have a pro glass cutting board comment. Uh, Nessie Doe, I just use mine to protect the wall behind my stove from the fat sprays. Easier to clean. That's all it's good for. Okay, I feel better. Yes, in lieu of a tile backsplash, glass cutting boards are awesome. All right, what do we got here? Thanks, Jane M. I'm not sure why I yell when people uh, join or donate, uh, but thank you. Welcome aboard, Joe and Grace. Thank you for joining. Make sure you tell all your friends. What do you think is the most overrated kitchen gadget Tabitha wants to know? Most overrated kitchen gadget. Let's see. That's a good one. What the heck would that be? Maybe waffle iron? No, that's not overrated because if you want to make waffles, that's all you can. That's all you could use. Um, hmm. I would say that thing they sold <clears throat> for making bacon into bowls. Remember that infomercial? And I would watch that. And at first, I was like, "Is the my pillow guy selling kitchen stuff now? Because this is so dumb." But then I realized that no, it was some some huckster selling a bowl that you put bacon in so you can make an edible bowl out of bacon. And then apparently, once you bake your bowl of bacon, you put stuff in it and then eat it. But none of it made any sense because what advantage is that over just eating bacon with that thing? No, it just was nonsensical to me. But one thing I've learned being this old is if you show drunk people bacon at two in the morning on an infomercial, they will probably buy that product. So in that way, it was a pretty genius idea. I think the George Foreman Grill sold a lot that way. They would cook bacon and people would come home from the bar and watch those infomercials. And they would think, you know what? I need one of those grills that makes the bacon. Just be careful, you can burn your foot on those. Uh, or so I've heard, excuse me. Donna Lamb sent all my knives to California to be sharpened. Wow, that's a long way to go. I, I don't know where you live. Are there no knife sharpeners near you? Usually hardware stores have knife sharpeners that come by. I don't know, that's been my experience. Uh, farmers markets, flea markets, sometimes will have a knife sharpener. Check your local uh, Google to see where a knife sharpener is. Um, if, you have the right equip if you have the right equipment, knife sharpening is not that hard to do. Um, so, hey, Michelle, will you grab me the knife steel? I'm going to show you one more piece of equipment that I just reminded myself with that question. Donna Land wants to know about the rod thing. So I'm going to show you what the rod thing does. But anyway, uh, yes, I send my knives out too, but not to a different state. Just find a local knife sharpener. It's usually like a few bucks per knife. And that really, really does a great job. Because uh, I'm quote unquote a chef and I can't even get them that sharp myself. And I, I can't, I don't have the patience for it. Uh, Tammy wants to know why do chefs wear those tall hats with the puffy tops? 
Uh, same reason those guys drive those giant trucks or ride those super loud motorcycles. All right, we're compensating for, uh, for other shortcomings. Uh, I think back in the day, they actually had a reason. Thank you. Oops. I think, ba I think back in the day, they, um, that's good. Thank you very much. I think back in the day, they actually had a purpose, maybe so you could tell who was in charge. Um, but then they just became a traditional kind of uniform thing. Um, now, of course, you know, keeping food out of the, or hair out of the food is not a bad idea. Also keeping food out of the hair. Uh, but as far as why the tall puffy, just fashion, they look super cool. <clears throat> All right, here is what we call a knife steel. And if I had a knife, Michelle, can you bring me the French knife, the just long knife? Uh, the, this is not a knife sharpener, uh, contrary to popular belief. If you have a dull knife and you use one of these, it doesn't get sharp. It just stays dull. But if you start with a, if you start with a sharp knife and you use this after and before each use, your knife will stay sharp like a long time. And I'll explain why. Thank you very much. All right. And what you do, I think it's like a 20-something degree angle. You'll, you can Google it. But if you run the blade, some people go this way. Some people go this way. Wow, this is really hard to see. But anyway, what this does, when you use a knife, microscopically along the blade, you get little dings and bends and cracks and crevices. And what the knife steel does is it lines all those molecules of metal. Oh yeah, molecules of metal. Lines them all back up and it holds the edge much longer. Because every time you use it, that like literally that microscopic edge gets less and less perfect. And once you do this, which sounds really good. Oh, and by the way, you always want to wipe off the shavings. Uh, this will stay sharp a long time. Having said that, if it gets dull, then that doesn't become as effective or effective at all. So I would say always use that before and after you use a knife, but only if your knives are sharp to begin with. That's why that comes generally when you buy the knife set. That's always in there. Uh, so you should use that. And I apologize, in this setting, it's hard to see because I, I like the camera. I'm on a webcam. Like, who the heck is still shooting with a webcam? I got to get a camera. I need a crew. I got to have lighting, wireless mics. I want one of those things that clips. One of these days, we'll get all set up, and uh, you guys will really get your money's worth. Uh, and by the way, yes, I think someone chimed in. I, I think I do have an old video about using the steel, and I explain it with a piece of paper and so forth. So go back and check it out. Uh, welcome, Mason. Welcome, F.B. Donovan. Welcome, Pete. Peter, can I call you Pete? Cool ba. Cool name. Bra. Uh, let's see. I'm getting behind on the questions as usual. Sorry, Chef. I can't agree with the use of steel. Angle is never correct. Prefer leather strop. Way more forgiving. Well, Blanco boy. Unless you work in a barber shop, where the heck are people getting these leather straps? Raise your hand if you have a leather strap. Is that German for strap? I think so. Anyway, yes, I know the leather does work, um, but most people just don't have it. And this, where is it? This thing comes in all the knife sets, so I must push back on you verbally. Yes, more people are saying I have a video for that. I have a video for everything after all these years. That's the one good thing about having done like 2,000 videos. Uh, all right, whoops, here we go. Chef, we would love your take on a vindaloo recipe someday. Joe, I'm pretty sure we did a vindaloo, uh, but I think I did it for lamb shanks. But the sauce would be similar. Um, so go check out, in the meantime, our lamb shank vindaloo recipe, and I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, John, 
made the pizza rustica, but only drained the ricotta for four hours and it was wet. Yes. Yes, the ricotta should be drained overnight. Uh, you can't really squeeze it in a cheesecloth. Um, I never had much luck trying to do that. I mean, you could try. You might get a few drips. But it has to be gravity, long period of time, let it drain. That's the way to do it. There's no shortcuts when it comes to ricotta. Or some people say, like me, regatta. Uh, I was told washing knives in dishwasher dulls the blade. Uh, I don't know if it dulls the blade, but it's usually really bad for the knife and the handle. So do not put your good knives in the dishwasher. Thank you, the light of my life. Appreciate it. And thank you to all the new members. Terence, if I, I hope I got that right. Uh, someone used canned peaches for our peach cobbler or peach cobbler crisp, and it came out, it became a soupy mess. Any fixes? No. After something is a soupy mess, that's usually what that's usually what it is. And you just buy some ice cream and you tell everybody that it's a peach sauce for ice cream, and you just change. You change the whole thing. You just blatantly lie to your dinner guests, and uh, you're doing it for their for their benefit. So it's fine. It's not a sin. Um, but no, uh, fresh peaches are the way to go with that one. Uh, the canned one really are super wet and watery. I guess you could drain it and then boil the juices down and then um, put it back in. But that sounds like a lot of work. Wait for peach season and make it like I did in the video. Uh, oh, here we go. What would happen? And if I skipped your question, it wasn't probably intentional. I just, these things jump around and I, I never figure out why they don't just flow. Uh, Adam is moving to the Bay Area in the fall. Do you plan on doing any in-person events, uh, quarantine notwithstanding? Uh, yes, I would love to do an event at Kismet once we open for business. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, in the meantime, not really. Um, I'm scared to go out in public under normal circumstances, but especially with a deadly pandemic going on. So, uh, so not in anything in the near future, but this fall, depending on what's happening, you never know. So stay tuned. Uh, you members will be the first to know and probably the only ones that I would trust showing up. Um, cause I cannot afford security. There will be no security. So please be careful. Tammy wants to know if I can do a churro recipe, uh, because, she couldn't find one on, on my YouTube. Um, yeah, I should do that this summer. Um, I'm going to show, using an extension cord, how to take your deep fryer outside because people are saying they love to deep fried recipes, but then their house smells like a deep fryer and a greasy spoon diner for like a week, which is true, unless you have really good ventilation. So, yes, this summer we'll, we'll go out, and I think we'll make churros outside. And I might even get one of those turkey fryers those big old fryers, uh, not to fry a turkey because, I don't know, I didn't, I've never been inspired to fry a turkey, uh, although I might try it. But anyway, those big turkey fryers seem amazing for doing big batches of French fries and chicken wings and donuts and uh, stuff like that outside without all the smell. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Lou, thank you for joining. Welcome aboard. People that are saying hi, uh, I would like to say hi back to you, but all at once. <clears throat> so every single person has said hi, hello, how you doing? Anthony is bragging, has a leather strop for a straight razor. If you're shaving with a straight razor, I don't know. That seems a little, seems a little extreme. It reminds me of Gangs of New York. Remember that? Is that how you roll? What was that guy's name? Bill the Butcher? Is there any difference in flavor between dry and canned beans? Jim wants to know. I don't think flavor there's a big difference. I think it's mostly texture. All right, if you, if you soak your beans and cook them from scratch dry, they generally, I think, feel better and have a nicer texture than what you get in a can, um, especially if you're buying off-brand beans at the dollar store, which some people do. Uh, I've done it. Uh, 
So the, the texture of a canned bean, that's, I think, where the downfall is. Um, having said that, canned beans are super convenient, and I have been known to use them often. Uh, let's see. Anthony wants to know what's better for wood fired brick oven, cast iron or carbine steel? I don't know because I don't have a fire uh, brick oven. I want one. If you know how to make one of those and you live near Northern California, uh, give me a holler. I would like to build a pizza oven out back. Uh, Lou made our tiramisu during quarantine. It was the best highlight ever. I agree. Tiramisu is a real pick me up. Uh, let's see here. Pre preference for kimchi fried rice, crusty or fluffy? Why do we have to pick fluffy, but then let the bottom get crusty? You can have fluffy, you know, most of it fluffy, and then severe, extreme, very, very pronounced crustification underneath. Do not settle for one or the other. Life's too short for only crusty or fluffy fried rice. So come on, Tim. Use both, and I think you're going to be happy with that. Have you seen Glenn and Friends' YouTube channel? He comments on you occasionally. Sounds like a fan. No, but now I'm going to sue him because he didn't get out. He did not get permission to mention me in the videos. So thank you. I'll pass it along to legal department. Glenn, we're coming for you and your friends. Oh, great tomato girl likes the beans and rice recipe. Very versatile, family favorite. Thank you. I love that recipe. I thought they came out really good. Sorry, I'm just resting my voice pretending to read comments. Do you grind pepper ahead of time? Yes. So when I say freshly ground black pepper, uh, that's been ground and I have it in a little ramekin. Um, and that is uh, just faster for the videos versus <laughs> by the way, I love Alton Brown, but he seriously has to stop with the drill and the pepper grinder thing. That is just why do you need to do that. Don't understand. I just use a little spice grinder coffee, you know, the, um, yeah, it's a spice grinder. I'm trying to think of the name of it. And I just said it, uh, as you're doing it, you got to shake it though. Otherwise you get big chunks of pepper and fine dust of pepper. So that took me a few years to figure out. But yes, I like to freshly grind pepper and keep it next to me in a little ramekin. Only in theory wants to know if there's gonna be a chance at Hispanic Copita recipe. Yes, a very good chance because I'm contractually obligated to do two videos every week. And I'm probably gonna be doing this for another 20 to 30 years. So I think chances are we're definitely gonna be doing one of those since We'll, eventually, we'll just run out of recipes and I'll have to start doing redos. Hello, everybody saying hello. Those are easier than questions. Hello. Yes. Biology guy, 52. Yellow mustard is great to marinate chicken in instead of buttermilk. I'm not sure if that's a question or a statement, but I think, yes, anything acidic, and flavorful generally works pretty good for chicken before you toss it on a grill. Uh, spices grow in a windowsill, Nick. I think you mean herbs, uh, but parsley is a no brainer. Rosemary, definitely. Thyme, very simple and easy. Um, those would be my top choices parsley, thyme, rosemary. I forget the other person in the song or the other herb in the song. But any, most herbs will grow in a windowsill, windowsill pretty nicely. Oh, basil works nice in a windowsill, as long as it's not too hot or too direct sun. So if it starts burning, uh, be careful. I know basil does like sun, but I've had a problem if it's just like super, super, super hot. <clears throat> uh, oh, Blanco Boy wants to know my thoughts on flavor enhancers like dashi, powders, or even MSG. I could do, I'm going to do a whole chat just on MSG. It is such a misunderstood topic in general and a misunderstood ingredient. Um, short answer, I have nothing against MSG. And if you throw a pinch and like some noodles and you're at a, uh, like an outdoor, you know, 
Asian food stand and you're going to eat a bowl of that deliciousness, then I'm very pro MSG in the right context. What I don't like about MSG is that America's fast food companies put just a gigantic amount in everything along with salt and sugar, and they have literally addicted people to horrible food that no one in their right mind would eat otherwise. But if you put enough MSG in a little fried chicken patty, fried chicken breast, I think we all know which place I'm talking about, and then put it on a little thin piece of white bread bun with three pickles, you'll have people lined up out the drive through for like a mile. like, And then they eat it and they get back in line. That's not because the sandwich was that good. It, that's all. That's all about the MSG. And it causes like severe cravings in some people, me included, which is why the old joke, like after you eat the Chinese takeout, you, you're hungry an hour later. That is MSG effect, I believe. Um, so I have a very complicated relationship with MSG. Um, I never get in the arguments with people like, hey, it's natural. It's not. Yeah, I know. It's totally fine. It's not poisonous. Um, although some people are allergic, but that's not my problem with it. It's how it's used in our casual takeout dining culture to trick people into thinking the food is way, way better than it is. All right. So, and that's about as deep and heavy. I want to get into that. But one of these days we'll do maybe a panel discussion somehow. Uh, can you do it on YouTube with all the different faces on the screen? Uh, and we'll yell at each other about MSG, pros, cons, tips and tricks, and funny anecdotes. All right, here we go. Oh, we're getting, oh, we're over time. Oh my God, I went over. No wonder my throat hurts. All right, we're going to, we're going to wrap this up. We're going to wrap this up soon. I'm going to try to get a last few questions in here. Thanks, Holly. How should pork riettes technique differ from duck riettes? This is, it's the same. Riette. Cook the meat till it falls apart, pack it with its own fat, and spread it on bread and eat it. You can't break riettes. Um, all right, everybody, I'm sorry if I missed your question. There's so many here. You guys are amazing. You really are. I mean, if only you could get paid for asking questions, you guys would be super rich because these are some great questions. I got to a good amount, I think. And But like I said, we're going over time. Uh, thank you, Jane Ann. Thank you, Scott. And all the new members, uh, I hope I thank most of you. Thanks, Paula. Richard, thank you. And all, the you, old, all you old timers, all you OGs that were there from the beginning and are still with us through the least interesting part of being a member, this getting set up phase. Uh, once we launched the new kitchen in the Kismet Farms and we're – picking tomatoes and then making videos with them. And I have like a, what's those things? One of those uh, GoPro cams on my forehead or maybe my chest or maybe both. Um, and then I'll be walking around and you'll be like, it'll be like you're me, uh, only in better shape and younger. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to sign off. Thanks, Jim. Someone has a rec for a router. Were, were we buffering? Last question, did the video buffer? Was it any better this time in my new location, in my living room? See, TV, bookcase. Was it any better? Tell me if it was better, and I'm going to sign off. It's night in it's night in England. Good night, England. All right, everybody say, oh, better, no buffering. Very good. All right, thank you, everybody. Say good night. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Good morning. Thank you. Everyone's saying thank you. Perfect. Everything was great. Kismet Wi-Fi for outdoors, yes. No buffering. Great. It's better. It was fine, Chef John. It's good. Much better. No buffering. No buffering. No buffering. All right. I got to sign off. I got a couple thumbs up. Thank you, everybody. We'll do this very shortly in a couple weeks or less. Uh, until, until then, uh, don't get too anxious to get out there around people. I know it's hard inside. So my last thing I'm going to say here, don't blow this. We've waited this long. We're all, we've all been shut in. Let's not all run out and play Twister and the thing starts spiking again. So hang tight for a few more weeks, month, whatever it is, 
and then we'll all go nuts and go crazy and we'll be around each other so much we'll get sick of it and we'll be like damn i miss i miss that shelter in place anyway have a great rest of the day thank you and as always enjoy whatever you're doing today